Once again, we want to thank you for tuning in to Crossings, a ministry of Calvary Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Dwight Lapine, and I'll be your host this morning as we get started in teaching you what the Bible says, not only about eternal life, but how to get to know God daily, moment by moment, in a personal way. We trust that this connection would really help you have a peace and a joy as you come to know Him and believe in Him. Again, we're looking at the subject of once to die, that Christ died one time, but also the fact that we have one time to die as well. We said last week by way of introduction that, that once a will has been signed and witnessed by two witnesses, it does not come into in, into being able to be uh, exacted or acted upon until the death of the testator. Once the, de the testator dies, then that will can once again be enforced. But until the death of the testator, the will has absolutely no value whatsoever. I want you to understand that it is, it is not just any will that is enforced. It is the last will in testament. And you have, when people write down on their will, a lot of times, even before they die, they can change their will. And so you have the last will and testament of Dwight Lapine. That's the one that's going to be acted upon and probate. That's the one that's going to be enforced in this world. You have two wills in the Bible. You have an Old Testament and a New Testament. The Old Testament was God's covenant with Israel in the Old Testament in the, the first portion of the Bible. But fortunately, we also have a last will and testament, the New Testament, that was put in force before Christ died. And of course, when he died, that will was enforced. You can imagine that if a will is brought before probate, and it's not clear. We don't understand what this guy really wants. Did he purposely mean to leave this person out of his will? Why does he mention some people and not others in his family? Is that really his, his intent? To leave his only daughter out of his will? Is that his, his really, in, his, is that his intent? And so the, the judge has to determine this and he has to decide, well, I have to be fair and, and, and impartial about this. And, and oftentimes, <laughs> We don't know what his will was because we can't go back and ask him. We just go by what he wrote down, and if we can't understand what he said, it makes it really complicated to try to enforce that will. Sometimes they have an administrator, and hopefully the administrator understands what his will was. And the administrator can carry out the wishes of that person. But you can, you can probably guess over the years that many, many people who have died, their will was not carried out. It was not enforced the way they wanted to, and if they could come back from the dead and come and talk to the judge, they would make this clear, that you blew it, man. That's not what I wanted. That's not how I wanted to, to have it enforced. But please understand this. It's a whole lot different when you have the Bible. Not only is it written down, the last will and testament of Jesus Christ, but he died and he rose again from the dead and he has become his own administrator. So if we want to know what he is, his will is for us, we can come before him and we can come boldly to the throne of grace. We can ask him what the will is and he can reveal his will to us. His will can be carried out because he's given to us the Holy Spirit within us and he has made it very, very clear what he wants us to do. Now, please understand that we have an old covenant and we have a new covenant. And the key word in the book of Hebrews is better. The new covenant is always seen as better compared to the old covenant. The book of Hebrews is a comparison between the two covenants. The problem with the old covenant is not that it wasn't holy. It was holy. It came from God himself. But as a contract between two parties, God was able to keep his part of it, but we were not. Because the old covenant is conditional, the new covenant is not conditional, the new covenant will be carried out according to God's will. There's only one party involved. He will keep his part of that. 
But the old covenant was conditional, and we failed. And because we failed, this covenant is not carried out according to, to what God's will was. Now, if you look in your Bible then, we'll start in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 25, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with the blood of others. The old covenant did not contain forgiveness of sins. Let me say it to you again. The old covenant did not contain forgiveness of sins. How do we know that there was not forgiveness of sins in the Old Covenant? Because the priest had to continually, continually, continually offer more sacrifices. There are just too many variables here. <laughs> I've sinned, but I sinned yesterday. I sinned the day before. I've sinned a lot. I don't have enough animals to pay for all of my sins. Which sin do I bring before the high priest? Which trespass offering or sin offering do I, do I bring an animal for? <laughs> how much, how many sacrifices do I need to make? How much blood needs to be spilled out? You understand that you have to have a perfect sacrifice. Well, is there any animal out there that's perfect? That has no blemish in him at all? How many blemishes can you have? We're looking at a fallen earth with fallen animals. Does this guy have the right kind of teeth? Does he have the right? Can he see well? Can he have, does he have good hearing? What's going on with this animal? Is he, is God going to accept this, this sacrifice? Is he propitiated or satisfied? There's a lot of variables in this old covenant. We just don't have the answers to all these questions. And yet, it seems that God accepted the sacrifices, except for Hophni and Phinehas, and except for Cain. Uh, most cases, he accepted their sacrifices. Every priest stands daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. You'll notice this. There is no place of rest in the temple. You have a lot of furniture there, no chairs. Where does the priest go to rest? He doesn't rest. He doesn't rest. There's no time for a break. You know, we've heard when you're kids, you've heard man works from sunup to sundown or whatever. A woman's work is never done. And we knew that that was true. We watched our moms and all the work that she did. And we appreciate that. You understand that women, priests were even worse, worse off than what you have. A priest's work could never even sit down. There's no lounge. There's no place to stop. There's no place of rest in the temple. A priest started his day and he ended his day standing up. Every priest stands daily, ministering and offering the same sacrifices. It's over and over and over again, the same sacrifice. <laughs> it is monotonous. It does not solve any problem. It does not take away sin. It can never take away sin. <clears throat> Again, once offered to bear the sins of many. If you look there at the last verse of chapter, chapter 9, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. Again, this is not a one-to-one -one ratio. It's not Christ Death is sufficient for one man's sin. It's estimated that there were probably close to 6 billion, listen, 6 billion to about 15 billion people on the earth at the time of the flood. Boy, there have been estimates as high as 120 billion. Just by taking account of how many kids that they had and how long they lived and how few people died, how long Adam lived, the estimates could be extremely high. We figure around 6 billion to 15 billion people at the time of the flood. After the flood, now we have about 7 billion people on the earth right now. Estimated about 20 billion who've been alive since the flood. We're not talking about a one-to-one -one ratio. His death, eternal death, 
was sufficient for every man. And listen to what it says. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for all sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. That's incredible. It's not a one-to-one ratio. Verse 27, let's go back one verse. As it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. He just talked about Christ dying one time, and now he's going to say that you also are going to die one time. It is an appointment that man had that you are going to die one time. Now please understand, there is a rapture coming, and the rapture may be that exception to this rule, because we understand that Enoch and we understand Elijah did not die. They were brought up to heaven, they were translated that they would not see death. And there is a rapture taking place that I believe probably the majority of people in this room are are going to be raptured. The majority of people are probably not going to die in this room. That's incredible. I believe that we live in probably the most exciting time in the whole history of the world right now. We live in the most exciting time because you probably will not die. It's actually a blessing to die because you will rise first and you will be with the Lord first. But those of us who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, with those who have died, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. It's going to be an incredible thing. But one thing I want you to understand, that if the rapture takes place in the next seven years, if it takes place within the next seven years, do you understand that in about seven to ten years, three and a half billion people are going to die. Three and a half billion. The first death is going to be one-fourth of the world's population is going to die by famines, disease, pestilence, and wars. And then later on in the book of Revelation, you have one-third of the people that die. Of everything that has breath dies. Minimum. That's not including those that are martyred for their faith. That's not including the battle of Armageddon. But minimum, three and a half billion people are going to die. We're living in a time period where the people on this earth think they're going to live a long, long time. They think they have 70, 80, 90 years based upon life expectancy. But we do know that that's not going to be true of every generation. There's coming a generation that within seven years, there could be as many as five billion people that die. True? Six billion. Six and a half billion. Close to seven billion people that may die. The one thing we all have in common, and again, the problem is we do not know when that's going to be. One thing I want you to share, it doesn't matter what, where you live, that doesn't, that's not a, a consideration when it, when it comes to death. Not a consideration of the rapture. It's not a consideration of this of the battle of arm of Gog and Magog. It's not a consideration of he's going to gather together nations from every kindred on, on, of the earth, and it's going to say that they're going to eat the flesh of captains, mighty men, flesh of horses, them and sit on them, small and great, bond and free. You're not going to prolong your life by your degrees. It's not, you're not going to prolong your life, listen, even by working out. I'm not against working out. But you are not going to add one minute to your life. Do you understand that? You have an appointment. And I don't care what food you eat. If you eat Special K morning, noon, and night for the next 20 years, it's not going to change your appointment. There is an appointment that God has for you. And if your appointment is such that you're going to die in a car accident in two weeks, if you sell your car and buy a motorcycle, it's not going to help you. If there is an appointment, (laughs) this time period is going to happen. I I really get a kick out of this because you understand that I'm not one that believes in, in election for salvation. 
But I do believe in election, but not for salvation. I believe that a person has, has the opportunity, whosoever will may come, and you can accept Christ up until your dying breath. But I do want you to understand that there is election, a huge election that God has for service. And, and sometime in the future, God's going to pick out of the Jewish people, the hardest nation probably to work with, right at this point, he's going to pick out 12,000 from every tribe. They're going to come to know him as Savior. <laughs> he's got this all planned. There's going to be a number of Jewish people that are going to accept him when the rapture takes place, when the battle of Gog and Magog take place. Many Jewish people are going to come to Christ and 12,000 are going to become witnesses for him. God knows that. There's going to be a national revival taking place. The Day of Atonement is coming for the Jewish people. 12,000 from each tribe are going to go out through the entire world and lead people to Christ. That's elected. Incredible. Again, by eating right, by clean living, <laughs> the, by filling your barns with, with food, you know, by having your freezer full. This man had barns and he tore down his barns, bore, built bigger barns. And the Bible says, thou fool, this night thy soul will, be, soul will be required of thee. You didn't know that. You didn't know that tonight was the night. The law is a shadow. Hebrews 10.1, for the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the coming of their comers there too perfect. Now again, the law is a shadow. <laughs> a shadow is not the reality. The shadow points toward the reality. Obviously, a shadow can look something similar. You can probably see shadows on the ground from the lights above us, but a shadow can look something similar to the object. Of course, in the morning, your shadow's really distended. It's distorted. At high noon, it's even more distorted because at high noon, you only have the shadow of the top of your head. It doesn't look much like you when you have the shadow of just the top of your head. You would not take a shadow of a saw and use it to cut a board. You would not take a shadow of a hammer and use it to pound in a nail. A shadow of a hammer does not help you. It can point out what the hammer does. It can point out the purpose of a hammer, but it cannot pound in a nail. The law was a shadow. Obviously, it pointed toward the reality. It gave you a very good image of what the reality was, but you could not use it to make comers perfect. It wouldn't do it. The law is righteous. The law is righteous, but it cannot make anyone else righteous. God is the only one who can make a person righteous. Now, I want you to understand that God has proven this over the dispensations. Every dispensation has a proof. But you hear these statements all the time today, and we're just going to go through and look at the proof of it. If you put man in a perfect environment, <laughs> if you could just take him out of the ghettos, and you could get him a nice house, and you could put him in a nice house, that's going to change him, and it's going to make him into a nice man. You agree with that? We were down in, in Miami, we, we were, had a, a youth ranch down in Miami, and they had put up all these brand new houses. Took, tore down the ghetto and put up these brand new houses. And they put these people in these brand new houses, and you would not believe it. Big holes in the doors. Windows were all broken. The dogs had a flap over the door where they had punched a hole in it so the dog could come in and out, and it looked like a ghetto. Only it was new houses that were a ghetto. God put Adam and Eve in a perfect environment. A perfect environment. Did it make them perfect? It was an experiment. It didn't work. If you have a perfect family, Adam and Eve had a perfect family. The kids were homeschooled. They didn't watch garbage on television. They didn't play Nintendo. It was a perfect environment. It was a perfect family. And yet one son kills the other son. Great. You can't ask for a better family. If you have a perfect law, 
That's what this world needs is more law. If we can get you more law, we can make this world perfect. Does it work? God gave the people a perfect law. It didn't work. Nothing wrong with the law. The people could not keep. It was a problem of their wills. If yet, not yet for all this, hearken unto me. If you won't hearken unto me, I will punish you seven times for your sins. And again, that's what happens. If you have a perfect government, by the way, this is number four, not number one. But if you had a perfect government, did God give them a perfect government? God gave them David. He gave him Solomon. He had a, this kingdom. He had a priest. He had organization. He had a military. He had a guy who loved the Lord with all his heart. Well, listen to me. If you put the millennium on this earth right now, Jesus Christ reigning on Jerusalem, a perfect government, will it make the people perfect? Even after the millennium, the devil is going to be released and he's going to gather, like the sand of the seashore, a number of people that want to fight against God. Even with Jesus Christ as the king over the earth, now, I don't care what, it, what you do, it does not work. The Bible says the law pointed to good things. Again, if you look again at chapter 10, verse 1, for the law having a shadow of good things to come, they were not good things in the present tense. They were good things in the future tense. There was nothing good in the past tense because the law could not make you perfect. All the law could do was condemn you. And I'm running out of time, and I've got to speed up my, my message here real quickly. But I want you to understand, what's the very last word of the Old Testament? If you looked at the very last word in the Old Testament, you know what the last word is? The New Testament ends with a blessing. Blessed are those that read the book of the prophecy of the book of Revelation. But the last word of the book of, Reve of, of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, is... What is it? Curse. The last word of the Old Covenant, the last word of the Old Testament, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. That is the Old Covenant in a nutshell. It doesn't bring you a blessing. It only points to good things to come. There's no blessing in the present tense. Now, having said that, this is the greatest thing right here. For them would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshippers once purged should have no more conscience of sins, but in those sacrifices, there's a remembrance again made of sins every year. There was no forgiveness in the Old Testament. That's the whole problem. That's the whole problem with the Old Testament. They couldn't have their conscience purged. You know, if you're looking at your Bible carefully, you'll see chapter 9, verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offer Himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the Lord. There's a purging of conscience in the New Covenant, but in the Old Covenant, verse 2, have no more conscience of sin. They had a conscience, and it was a conscience of sins. Now again, skip back over to chapter 8, verse 10 of Hebrews, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds. I will write them in their hearts. I will be to them a God. They shall be to me a people. They will shall teach, not teach every man his neighbor, every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me from the least to the greatest. I will be merciful unto their unrighteousness and their sins and iniquities. I will remember no more. That is the difference. It's why Israel went into captivity. It's why they lost control of the land. It's why they lost their kingdom. It's why they lost their priesthood. Because God had a ledger sheet and they kept breaking the law and God kept account of their sins. Their sins were never forgiven. It was never forgotten. Their sins were always before them. Every day the high priest would offer another sacrifice, would bring back to their memory, this is where you failed. But when Jesus Christ died on the cross, if you look at chapter 10, verse 17, what does it say? And their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. That's what we have. It's so different from what they had. God does not keep track on a ledger sheet of your failures and your sins. But friends, there are many, many people in this world that still live by that old covenant, by that law, 
and they have no peace in their heart because they don't know that God has forgiven them. They still live from sin to sin to sin to sin and they live a defeated life. They have no understanding of what Jesus Christ did on the cross and how sufficient that death was for them. And their religion is all about guilt. And I'm telling you, you, you could be a Baptist and you're constantly living in guilt because of your sin in your life of what you've done and you cannot forgive yourself. You cannot go past this sin that's that you've committed in your life, and you're still living under that old covenant. And you still think that God has some ledger sheet that He's keeping track of all your sins. You know, when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ is not a judgment on sin. It's a judgment on works. According to that, you have done but remember, if you look at verse 18 of Hebrews 10, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. He died once because there is remission. And when there is remission, there is no more remembrance of sin. And your sin will never be brought up again because it's been judged. Not in my life, it was judged on the cross. And there's a huge difference between this new covenant and the old covenant. Do you really want to go back under that old covenant? and have to deal with that day by day and day by day conscience of sin that could not be cleared, that you live in that conscience of having hurt people, that you've hurt God, that you've destroyed your relationship with God. Listen, what Jesus Christ did on the cross was incredible for us. It gives us such a freedom. I'm not saying that you don't bring your sin before Him and, and ask forgiveness, but I want you to understand that your sin was judged on the cross and you are perfected forever and it will never be brought up again at the judgment seat of Christ because it's forgotten. And that is such a tremendous, tremendous relief and such a tremendous freedom. Don't you agree? Don't you love the fact that God has forgiven and forgotten? And we don't have to live under that old covenant. That old covenant God kept adding and adding and adding and adding. But that's not where we're, where we're at. <laughs> we have freedom. And our sin has been completely paid for and sent away forever and perfected forever. Sanctified. Made pure and holy by the blood of Christ. I hope that helps you. It sure helps me. It sure helps me not to have that sin that I commit against God being a weight that destroys my conscience, destroys my relationships. That my worth is based upon the fact that Christ died on the cross for me. I want to thank you for tuning into our program. It's been a delight to have you. I trust that you understand a little bit more about what Jesus Christ did for you when he died on the cross. Salvation is not something that you receive because you're born into a family or because you go to church or because you're good. Salvation is a free gift, but that gift has to be received. If you have not received it, we'd like to have you take some time to talk to God and ask Him that He might be your Savior. You understand that you are a sinner, that Jesus Christ died for you, that you can know that you have eternal life by putting your trust in Christ today.